Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar brought to you by the RTO ERO Foundation. This is the fifth webinar in our 221 series. The RTO ERO Foundation invests in programs, research, and training to support healthy, active aging for all Canadians. Our activities aim to improve seniors' health care and social isolation and combat ageism. My name is Joanne Murphy, and I'm the chair of the board of directors for the foundation. I'm very excited for today's webinar, and we'll introduce today's presenters, Dr. Paula Rochon and Dr. Rachel Savage, in just a moment. Before we get started, I'd like to deliver our land acknowledgement statement. <clears throat> we acknowledge, recognize, and honor the ancestral traditional territories on which we live and work and the contributions of all Indigenous peoples to our communities and our nation. Nous reconnaissons et honorons les territoires traditionnels ancestraux sur lesquels nous vivons et travaillons, ainsi que la contribution de tous les peuples autochtones à nos communautés et à notre nation. Merci, thank you, miigwech. So today's presentation will take roughly 40 minutes and then we will have time for questions. When we get to the discussion section after the presentation, we ask you to type your questions into the Q&A and we'll get to as many of them as we can. Let's get started with today's webinar. We are joined today by Dr. Paula Rochon and Dr. Rachel Savage, who will be delivering a presentation entitled Women's Age Lab and Gendered Ageism with a Focus on Older Women. This is, I believe, the third time we've had the pleasure of a webinar presentation by Dr. Rochelle and her team. So I'm sure many of us are familiar with her background. Dr. Paula Rochelle is a geriatrician and a senior scientist at Women's College Research Institute. She is also the inaugural Retired Teachers of Ontario Chair in Geriatric Medicine, University of Toronto, since 2015. Her research career focuses on understanding the unique needs of older adults, particularly women. She is one of the leading Canadian health services researchers in geriatric medicine. In particular, her research explores how to promote health and well being in older adults by optimizing their drug prescribing. Our co presenter today is Dr. Rachel Savage. Dr. Savage is an epidemiologist and a research scientist at Women's College Research Institute. She has over 10 years of local and provincial public health experience. Her research aims to improve the health of older adults, immigrants, and women. <coughs> She is the principal investigator of a national study funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research <coughs> that explores how loneliness and social isolation affects how older adults <coughs> use the healthcare system. We're so honored to have you here today. Please <coughs> I turn it over to you. So thank you so much, uh, Joanne. Uh, we really appreciate your, uh, your lovely introduction as always. And it's a pleasure uh, to be here uh, with you today. So we're gonna be talking about uh, Women's Age Lab and gendered ageism. So for the goals for today's presentation, like to provide an overview of Women's Age Lab, which is a really exciting new center uh, that has just been launched that focuses on older women, and to talk to you a little bit about why this is so important and why it's needed. We're going to describe our progress and our focus areas of action for this Age Lab, and discuss in particular how we've worked together and opportunities that we have to continue to work together so that we can improve the health and well-being of older women. So when you, when you think about it, you know, why is Women's Age Lab something that's needed? 
you know, older women clearly encounter challenges in meeting their health needs. They're impacted, as we will talk about, by both their age and by their sex. And they're largely, uh, unfortunately, invisible. And their voices, you know, we don't believe have really received the attention that they should. Yet, it's important to know that older women have unique health and social needs. So it's very important to look at this group and to study this group. Um, so supporting healthy aging of women by reimagining a society where older women and their distinct health needs and well-being are recognized and addressed is something that's incredibly important. And we believe that together with researchers, with healthcare providers, with community organizations such as yourself, we will be a catalyst to really improve the lives of older women here, and not just here in Toronto, but across the country and around the world. Now, it's important to note that, you know, already we've talked a lot about women, and that's a very important group. Often a lot of the work that we do just talks about older people in general. And when we focus on women, it's important to know that we're also learning a lot about men. So for Women's Age Lab, we've you know, put together some things that are really important to us. And this is uh, our, our commitment, really. We're really all in this together. At Women's Age Lab, we're committed to building an inclusive, just, and equitable community that values, supports, and honors the wisdom, the lived experiences, and the contribution of all people. And we do really aim to cultivate a culture of equity, diversity, and inclusion in everything that we do. So we want to be very welcoming in terms of the work that we're doing and uh, the women that we are studying here. Now, I'm so excited to talk about Women's Age Lab. And it's amazing to think that Women's Age Lab is the first to our knowledge and the only center of its kind. Uh, and it's just been launched here based at Women's College Hospital and it's designed to improve the health and well-being of older women. You know, and I think if you think about it a bit, it's, it's probably a bit chilling to think that despite, you know, older women representing more than half of the older population, we will, to our knowledge, be the first center of its kind to really focus on older women. And when I say first center of its kind, first center of its kind that we can identify in the world. So our vision is to have a world where science is used to recognize and address the unique health needs of older women. And our mission is really to improve the lives of older women by using science as a way to transform care and practice and drive health systems and social change. So when we talk about uh, older women, you know, that already is sort of a, a, a focus, but clearly it's still a vast, vast area. And for Women's Age Lab, we've identified a series of areas of priorities for our, our focused action. So one of these is addressing gendered ageism, as this uh, is an important theme that really runs through all of our work. And we're gonna talk about this more uh, but I, I wanted to put that out there as that's one of our areas of focus. We're also reimagining aging in place and the idea of congregate care. And I think we can all imagine that this is especially important now, you know, during the COVID uh, time period. We're optimizing therapies so that they're tailored to the needs of older women. And we're promoting social connectedness to reduce uh, the major problems of loneliness. And again, loneliness is something that I think has always been important, but it's even more important uh, during COVID. And then we have a cross-cutting tool, and that is the use of sex and age disaggregated data. As a starting point uh, for when we're doing studies and when we're talking about uh, aging, that we're looking at women, men, and different age groups. So we can really learn about this group. So again, as, as, as we've said, when you study women, you're gonna learn a lot about other groups and in particular about men as well. 
So when we think about our strategic objectives for Women's Age Lab, it's kind of unique, I think, in terms of the work that we're gonna be doing. So it follows what we call a no do act trajectory. We're going to be identifying and study issues uh, in the health and social, related to health and social care that are all designed to improve the lives of older women. The no piece is really based on science. And I think this is something that really distinguishes the work that we do. It's really based in science. And the do piece is incredibly important because we're not going to be just doing the science, which is incredibly important, but we're finding ways to put that science into action in our communities uh, so that we can spread and scale that information. Uh, and then the last piece is we need to act on it and we need to, we need to talk about our work. So in particular, we need to use stories to share information with the objective being really to increase public awareness and to, to drive policy change. And that's something that we don't do enough and something that we're uh, being very purposeful about doing here at, women, at the Women's Age Lab. And this process will drive health system and social change. Now, through uh, the research chair that I've had the privilege to hold uh, from the RTO ERO, we've already been able to work closely with the RTO ERO membership in shaping our research. And there's excellent alignment with our focus on promoting health and wellness of older women with the RTO ERO membership. So just interesting, just to look at the demographics here, you know, 67% of the membership are, are women. And when you look at the age group, we have more than 60% of the membership that are in the 65 to 74 year old age group. So clearly uh, there's lots of um, opportunities for us to continue to work together as it relates to um, our initiative related to older women. And with that in mind, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Rachel Savage, who's gonna discuss some of the work that we have already been doing with you, and also to discuss some of the opportunities that we will have to work together. So over to you. Thank you so much, Paula. Um, so I've been a part of Dr. Roshan's team since about uh, 2018, when I joined as a, a trainee, a postdoctoral fellow. And one of the first projects I was involved with um, was such an amazing project. And it was working with RTO, ERO, on a qualitative study. And what we were really interested in is talking with members uh, to hear about their perspectives uh, of aging, um, both you know, personally and, and at a societal level and really learn about their experiences. So I think we can all recognize that it's so, so important to understand the needs, the values, the priorities of older adults um, when we think about creating responsive policies, services, and research agendas, um, which are meant to offer kind of meaningful solutions to our aging society. But I think uh, we all sort of recognize that the voices of older adults themselves don't often get, you know, the platform that they deserve. So um, in the spring of 2018, we uh, did four focus groups with members uh, to have a, a discussion about your experiences with, with aging. And they were such illuminating uh, conversations. And we um, identified several themes and I'm just gonna touch on a couple of them today. So we have presented this work in the past, but for, for those of you that haven't heard of it, um, I wanted to share some of our results really briefly. So the first was really kind of a good news story. And that was that um, members actually found their experiences with aging to be more positive than what they had expected based on, you know, watching and observing their, their family members as they aged. Um, there were lots of stories about, you know, picturing aging to be like sitting on a rocking chair in the corner of of the room and, and leading this quiet, isolated life. And, and members certainly didn't feel like that was their experience. They were going out and doing all of these things um, and having really full and fulfilling uh, lives. 
But despite that, they had encountered some um, health challenges. So they weren't immune to, you know, um, sort of the biological process of aging. And even though they consider themselves a healthier generation uh, compared to, you know, their parents and, and their grandparents, they were still sort of encountering some of those uh, setbacks. Um, another theme that we identified was the importance of maintaining health and social connections. So we kind of weren't surprised that members really valued and prioritized health as they were aging, but maybe what was a bit more surprising was how equally important uh, social connections were to members as they aged. And we talked a lot about the importance of social relationships and, um, and yet how challenging it was to maintain those, um, you know, amid loss or changing health status and some of the structural barriers like transportation, uh, access to housing and, and things like that. When we asked at a societal level what people thought were some of the, the greatest challenges of an aging society, the first one, I think the most prominent one was, um, you know, strengthening the healthcare system. And I noticed there's a comment about that in the, in the Q&A, which we'll be happy to, to talk about. Um, so for, for male participants, uh, their discussions really focused on accessibility to healthcare, while um, female participants talked a little bit more about quality of care and needing to, to make some improvements um, with that regard. So things like, um, you know, having adequate time for patient care, uh, continuity of care, engaging patients and empowering them uh, to manage their own health, uh, cultivating communication and trust uh, between uh, healthcare providers and, and patients. Those were all things that were really valued are certainly consistent with the person-centered approach to, to healthcare and, and opportunities, uh, I think certainly to strengthen the healthcare system. In terms of thinking about some of the, um, the strengths of an aging society, uh, I think the biggest one that members identified was that, you know, the sheer mass of, you know, the current demographic that's kind of going through this transition. So they talked about being a critical mass of people who were really interested in making a difference, uh, politically self-aware, and they recognize the opportunity they have to improve uh, the health and lives of older people. So Paula already showed um, a similar slide showing what our four areas of focus are for the Women's Age Lab, but I, I just wanted to kind of bring some of these priorities back to the conversations that we had with RTO members to really show you that a lot of your priorities and um, really align with, with ours and certainly, um, you know, what we learned by speaking with members really helped to directly shape some of the things that we've chosen uh, to focus on here. So in the next few slides, I'm just gonna provide some examples. So the first one is addressing gendered ageism. So, and I love this quote, um, there's a link uh, to the slide um, at the bottom left that shows where this work has been published for people that are interested in reading the, the full report. We can certainly make it available as well to members, but it was in the, in the published paper as well, because I, I just think it really captures the essence, I think, of a lot of you um, and your you know, approach uh, and, and thoughts around aging. So this quote says, we don't have to age the way our parents did, so let's get on with it. I think we heard that older adults really want to be empowered to create new ways for things to be done. Uh, they want to confront outdated ideas of what it means to grow old. They want to challenge stereotypes um, and, and they want to be active contributors to finding uh, solutions. And of course, um, you know, some of these ideas around aging are, are also linked to um, sex and, sexism and effects you know, the sexes in, in different ways. And, and some of these stereotypes are um, focused more in, in older women, which we're gonna talk about uh, later in the, in the presentation. But, you know, it's really about bringing everyone together and, and giving older adults a platform and working together with older adults to really make sure that everyone has an equal opportunity to age well. 
The next um, area of focus is, as Paula said, reimagining aging in place. And, um, you know, not surprisingly, many members in our focus groups expressed an overwhelming desire to age in place and remain in the communities where all of their social networks were established. You know, there is a fear um, most people hold around having to go into long-term care. This fear has really certainly intensified, I think, for many uh, throughout the pandemic. So one of our key, key priorities um, is helping identify and test new and creative ways to facilitate aging in place and, and aging in, in congregate settings. So, um, you know, here's a quotation from one of the, the members about, you know, where they wanted to age and that was, you know, staying in, in their home. Um, across all the focus groups, participants were really wary of polypharmacy, so that's taking multiple medications at the same time for fear of adverse effects uh, and drug interactions. So this one participant talked about how scary it was for her to see her friends being put on more and more medications at every physician visit. And so she talked about some active efforts she made in partnership with her healthcare provider to manage and limit the number of medications she was on to only those that were really medically necessary. Um, so she said, I, I only take one pill. I took three and I talked to my doctor into getting me off two. I said, I really don't think I need to be taking this. And, and she said, I agree. Uh, so we've learned that older adults really value medication reviews, learning about alternatives to managing their chronic conditions and, and really um, the importance of thoughtful prescribing. And we're going to be building on an already well-established platform of research that Dr. Roshan has led uh, to look at how we can optimize uh, therapies for older women. And the last um, one that's really dear to my heart and an area of my uh, research focus is promoting social connectedness. And um, you know, in the in the focus groups, we uh, discussed that there are really a lot of broader structural challenges older adults face to staying socially connected. I talked to, about access to housing, transportation you know, where senior centers are located, particularly in, in rural communities and having enough of them. Um, this quotation talks about actually the placement of long-term care and, um, and, and focuses on, you know, we need to think about where long-term care uh, homes are, are located. Uh, so it makes sense for people to stay connected. Um, so often, you know, they really should be in the heart of most communities, but are often, you know, located outside of city centers and, and that can really disconnect uh, older adults from their, their social networks, um, and even sometimes from their spouses and make it difficult to stay connected. So we recognize the importance of advocating for communities and governments to play an active role in addressing loneliness. So thank you so much. And I mean, I think the work um, and our learnings from working with the RTO or ERO have been so important in shaping our thinking. So it's really, uh, it's very important to look at that work. So this image talks about, I think one of the huge opportunities we have here with Women's Age Lab is we're taking the area of women's health and we're taking the area of healthy aging, two important areas where there's been a lot of attention, but we're really bringing them together um, so that we can look at the intersection of these two and really focus on women and the aging component. Uh, so that's something that's very important and unique. So I'm going to go through uh, these areas of focus in a bit more detail and just uh, sort of talk about why these things are so important for uh, women, older women in particular. So women in congregate care, you know, as we've heard, this is something that I think has become, um, you know, more apparent and has had a lot of attention during COVID. And there's obviously a lot of concerns uh, related to long-term care and a lot of need to, to, for improvement. So let's look at this uh, a little bit more as it relates to women. So it's interesting to know that the vast majority uh, of older women 
live in the community. They're living in their own homes and clearly that's where they want to stay. And that was sort of um, something we saw from one of the quotes that came from your membership. But it is important to know that older women make up the majority of the long-term care home residents. And in fact, about 70% of these residents are women. Most of them are, 80% of them are over the age of 75. And often they have uh, different chronic conditions. But this is a piece that I don't think is well enough recognized. And I don't think we've taken the opportunity to think about what should congregate care look like when we're thinking about women uh, being the primary people in there. So we need to find ways to support older women so they can get the care that they need uh, and where appropriate to stay in their homes, but to make also congregate care something that works well for older women. Another area of our, our focus is uh, women in medications, uh, a very important area, something that I've cared about for, for many, many years. It's important for older people and women. When you think of it, two out of three older people are taking five or more medications, and one in four uh, older people are taking 10 or more. But even perhaps more striking is the use of potentially inappropriate medications is highest in older women. And it's also important to know that older women are the group that are more likely to develop medication side effects. So we really need to find strategies to tailor the way we provide drug therapies to meet the specific needs of older women uh, so that they can get the benefit without harm. Now this interesting when you think about, you know, why is it that we don't necessarily have the information that we need uh, to best provide medications for older women? And this, I think, goes back to some of the policy environment. And I was thinking about one of the very first uh, studies I did as a student uh, when I was in the United States was to look, uh, and I, I found uh, uh, information that showed that older people and women were really not in well included in clinical trials of conditions that really matter to them. So in this case, I've been looking at arthritis, which, which is a condition that increases with age and is particularly prominent in women. And the reason perhaps that women haven't been as well studied and older women in particular goes back to the policy environment. And back in the 90s, when I was doing this work, it, it was interesting to know that it wasn't until then that there was, um, the Congress passed an act saying that women needed to be included in clinical trials that were funded by the NIH, which is a major funder of research in the United States. But it's also interesting to know that it wasn't until 2019 that the NIH also said that we needed to include older people in clinical research uh, funded by their organization. So you put the two things together and it's probably not a surprise that we don't have as much information as we should have about older people and especially older women from clinical research. And so clearly this is something uh, that we need to address to make sure that we have the evidence that's needed. Now, women and loneliness is another piece that comes up and we've talked about uh, as one of our priority areas and the importance of creating connections. So in Canada, it's interesting to know that loneliness is something that, of course, impacts everyone, especially women. And I think all of us, especially during COVID-19, have experienced what this is like and realize the importance of it more than ever. But among older adults in Canada, women are actually twice as likely as men to live alone. And 40% of the women who are living alone describe themselves as being loneliness. Lonely. So you might ask, you know, why is it why is lonely important? Well, it's important because it really does impact health. And I think, you know, there's a lot of ways to talk about this, but one that really struck me was that the former uh, US Surgeon General said that the impact of loneliness on health is like smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So clearly something that we need to find uh, ways uh, to reduce. And so again, we're going to turn, I'm going to turn over to uh, Dr. Savage, and she's going to talk about some of the very important work that was done 
uh, working with the RTO ERO to look at uh, loneliness during COVID-19. Thanks. So we had another wonderful opportunity to collaborate with um, the, the team at RTO ERO during the pandemic to understand the impact of the pandemic it, during the first wave. So kind of seven weeks into our lockdown here in Ontario. Uh, we wanted to understand the impact to older adults because at the time that we did the survey, there wasn't really any published research that looked specifically at older adults um, and how the pandemic and the, the uh, lockdown had been affecting them. And we knew that was really important at the time. We knew older adults were at risk for more severe outcomes, so they were probably even more impacted by a lot of the, the physical disting distancing measures that were in place. So uh, we really quickly mobilized and, and worked collaboratively um, with the leadership to send out an online survey to members uh, in early May. Um, so that survey would have gone to anyone who had a registered email address with the RTO um, and who the address was, was valid for. And um, we looked at a few different things. So I'm going to start by talking first about uh, loneliness during the lockdown and then uh, next about uh, the use of virtual connection and digital technologies to stay connected with family and friends. So we were really interested in looking at loneliness um, because there were concerns, obviously, uh, that this issue would be exacerbated by the physical distancing measures, particularly for older adults who were living alone. And so we asked members whether they had felt lonely in the preceding week and classified them as lonely if they were reported feeling lonely on one or more days. You can see from this figure that about half, so 49% of women respondents um, reported that they felt lonely. Uh, and this is in comparison to about a quarter of men. So 28% of uh, male respondents reported feeling lonely. And um, overall about 10% reported sort of like severe feelings of loneliness so that they reported that they were feeling lonely every day in the preceding week or almost every day. Um, so these findings were actually quite consistent with other studies that were, were later published in uh, the UK and in the, in the US. Another thing that was important to us, not just understanding the, the magnitude of the issue, but also who was at greater uh, likelihood of experiencing loneliness. So we, we looked at a number of different factors that we thought uh, probably played a role. So one of the ones that you could see, um, you know, really had a significant impact or significantly predicted the likelihood of being lonely was living alone. And this was actually even more significant uh, when we looked at relationships in men and women differently. So you can see that um, men who were living alone had more than four times, um, they were Four, more than four times as likely uh, to report loneliness than men who lived with others. Um, whereas for women, um, that likelihood kind of increased about threefold. Disruptions to routines were really an important factor as well, um, as was being female. And um, so just regardless of uh, a woman's living situation, whether they lived with others, or alone, um, in both circumstances, we found that just being uh, female relative to male increased your, your likelihood of being lonely. And there's a, a number of reasons potentially for this, but one is that you know women might just be more likely to acknowledge um, that they are of course feeling lonely and, and be candid about their, their feelings. Um, and then I have on the, the slide some other you know, factors that have been shown to be important uh, predictors of loneliness uh, in other studies as well. So uh, being in fair or poor health, um, receiving care or being a caregiver to others. And then there were some unique things um, related to the pandemic that were also important. So that's you know, kind of feeling hopeless about the current situation that there weren't really any silver linings 
uh, of the pandemic. And then of course, being anxious, like having a high degree of concern uh, about the pandemic. Um, and you could see how that would sort of translate into, you know, what risks you were willing to take in terms of um, staying connected with others. So these findings really highlight uh, the need to consider older adults, particularly those that are living alone and women, um, how we can really support them uh, as the pandemic persists and, and really um, make sure that they feel, feel socially connected. Um, this slide is, you know, beyond the pandemic, we have a, a program of research that I'm leading that's looking at loneliness and social isolation in older adults and how that impacts um, healthcare utilization at a health system level. And um, so these are a series of studies that we have currently underway and uh, the RTO ERO is a part of this research. They're part of our study advisory committee and, and weigh in on a lot of aspects of this work. Um, but the first is to really explore the role of, of sex and gender, and that really hasn't been done in uh, the research on loneliness to date. We know that there are common contributors to loneliness, like losing a, a partner or declines in health. But we also know from the few studies that exist that some of the factors affect um, men and women differently and probably gender diverse people as well, but we don't really have good information on them. And that's something that we need to, to advocate for um, in thinking about uh, furthering this research. Um, so we're gonna be exploring some of these differences and we've had a, a master's of public health student, Mindy Liu, who has done some of this work uh, over the summer uh, looking at older immigrants in particular. So uh, we'll be happy to come back and maybe share those findings when uh, they're ready. Um, other sort of briefly, uh, just to go back to the, the previous slide, we're also going to be looking at um, how loneliness and social isolation affect how people use healthcare services. And we're, we're going to be looking for uh, solutions to loneliness. And this is an area that certainly um, hasn't received a lot of attention to date. So we don't really have good evidence of what works at a population level to address this issue. And we're gonna be piloting and evaluating an intersectoral co collaboration um, of which RTO, ERO will be part. Thanks. So thank you. So the last area that we were focusing on in those areas of focus for Women's Age Lab is addressing gendered ageism. So this is a term that you, you've heard the term ageism that was um, put forward by a famous geriatrician, Robert Butler in the 1960s. Uh, but it wasn't until about 25 years later that the idea of gendered ageism was introduced, which is really the intersection of ageism and sexism. So basically when you think about gendered ageism, it's discrimination that's based not only on your age, but on your sex. And this is something that's been increasingly recognized, I would say, as being something harmful, especially to older women. And it's really, for the most part, not been well recognized. It's uh, interesting that ageism, for example, like poverty, quite recently has now been determined to be what you call a non-medical factor that is shaping your health. And so therefore, it's been described as uh, a social determinant of health and perhaps a situation that's worse for women than for men. And it, it can start in a variety of different ways. It's, it's the idea of maybe you know, not um, showing signs of aging. So for example, gray hair uh, in older women is maybe considered a sign of aging. And of course people dye their hair and do all sorts of things to, to change that. Whereas for example, in men, it may be viewed quite differently and it may be viewed as distinguished. So it has a different kind of connotation. Um, there's been a lot of interest in ageism recently, and uh, there had been a, a piece written about this. And so uh, we wrote a comment saying that we shouldn't just be talking about ageism, we really need to talk about gendered ageism. And this was published in The Lancet, which was one of the big uh, medical journals uh, that gets a lot of attention. We did this with Serbi Kalia, our strategy lead, and also with Paul Higgs, who's a well-known sociologist from 
University College um, London uh, to talk about this issue. Now, when we think about gendered ageism, this is sort of a thread that runs through those areas that I we discussed and we've been talking about. So it may in part explain, you know, why is it that we don't have the research evidence we should about uh, older people and especially older women from clinical studies to inform the way we give drugs the very best possible way? And why is it that there's more uh, women than men in long-term care? You know, does that relate to their finances? Does it relate to women traditionally having caregiving roles? You know, we need to think about these things. And you've just heard a lot about uh, loneliness. Uh, so these are important things that we will be thinking about in all of the work that we do. And we've talked about how we want to get this work out into the world and get people talking about it. So the piece that we wrote for The Lancet was picked up um, by the OECD. Uh, they contacted us and said they were really interested in us writing about gendered ageism as it relates to sort of the economic world. And um, so we wrote for them a piece that talked about uh, really what it means in terms of retirement income and how gendered ageism relates to that. Now, the uh, OECD is a, a big organization uh, that I say is, it is involves, uh, I think, almost 40 countries around the world. Uh, and so it has a very different kind of audience, uh, but one where clearly these issues are important as well. And in that piece, one of the bits we talk about is what gendered ageism means for older women today in terms of pension gap. So when you think about it, older women today, when they were in the paid workforce, were perhaps less likely to even enter the workforce. But when they were in the paid workforce, uh, they often were paid less than their counterparts. And they often had to take time away from uh, work for childcare responsibilities. And so they didn't have as many um, years of work accrued, so to speak. And they were probably less likely to advance in their career. So all of this comes together to, to lead to less lifetime earnings, which relates to pension. And uh, that leads to a, a poverty gap for older women. And the OECD, uh, which is, uh, as I say, one of the major leaders for economic type thinking in the world, uh, have said that that leads to a pension gap of about 26% uh, for women. And this is a beautiful figure that was put together by Joyce Lee, who is a member, a very talented member of our Women's Age Lab, lab team. Uh, and this is important because you think about it, women in terms of pensions will have less income and they also live longer generally than men. And so as a result, we'll be living longer with less. And so that's something that clearly needs to be addressed and changed. So, so excited to say that the Women's Age Lab officially launched on October 1st. Um, and so we are now uh, really uh, out there starting to do this important work. And we launched on October 1st because that was the International Day of Older Persons. And on that International Day of Older Persons, um, each year, they have a sort of a celebration of older persons and they have a theme. And this year, the theme was on digital equity for all ages. Uh, so um, in addition to the launch, uh, myself, along with uh, Rachel Savage here and Serbi Kalia wrote an op-ed that was published in the Toronto Star on um, digital inequity. And what it really points to is some of the issues related to um, the digital world and how that impacts uh, older people and especially women. So this clearly relates, for example, to COVID and, and long-term care and lockdown when it, uh, digital technology was one of the few ways that people could connect with family and friends. And so this was very important obviously for older women who make up the majority of the older population and the, the majority of long-term care residents as well. And it also means, for example, um, we found some interesting things about how women and men communicate and women are more likely to use these digital devices for social communication. But often, I don't think that these devices are made in such a way that it's easy to facilitate that sort of thing. Uh, so they haven't really been designed necessarily for women in mind or for older women in mind. 
it's also important to remember that this technology is expensive. You know, um, you know, phones are expensive and computers are expensive and women may not always have the same resources um, to be able to purchase these, especially older women. So we need to think about that. And I guess one other piece that it relates to the loneliness piece that we discussed is women are more likely to live alone. And I think we can all say it's very helpful to have somebody else in your home to help you when you get into inevitable kind of technology challenges. So something uh, to think about and something that we wrote about. And I'll ask um, Dr. Savage if you wanna connect just briefly about some of what we've learned with our work from the RTO era around uh, connections and COVID. Yeah, so we, we looked at this issue actually in the survey that we administered in um, May of 2020, and we found that 15% of members uh, were not using social networking sites or apps to communicate with friends and family. And the people who were not using it were more likely to be men, to be those who were um, of advanced age, living alone in poor health and have access to, to lower so social support and um, to some of the, the um, actual, you know, hardware that's kind of required to, to make these connections. So I think this work just sort of illustrates again, some of the inequities that are in place um, and, and thinking about uh, how we can help support um, members and all older adults uh, to stay connected. Thank you. Uh, clearly important to re rethink uh, how we can make a digital technology accessible. And so then Women's Age Lab, you know, why Women's Age Lab? I think we've given you a lot of information about why it's so timely and so important. Um, and to, to think about the things that we're able to do here uh, in order for science about older women to have an impact, clearly we need to go beyond the traditional things that we've done from a science perspective. We need to translate information into practice, uh, put it out there in the community so that people can use it. Uh, we need to think about how do we work with younger people, younger people with older people, because it's those younger people that will become older and working together, there's so much that we can do. And clearly we wanna work uh, with the community uh, like the RTO ERO uh, to find ways uh, to, uh, to make sure that this is helpful and useful. And throughout this, um, we're looking to make sure that we're creating situations that advance uh, gender equity. So in terms of our plans going forward, we're going to be working locally within our own hospital to find ways uh, to learn more about the older women that are coming to receive care here. What are their needs? What can we do to improve their health? Uh, often those are things that are not necessarily asked. Clearly working with the community uh, people like uh, the RTO ERO to find ways to engage and to come up with uh, information that's uh, important to you and things that will be helpful. And then globally, we want to connect with important international initiatives. For example, there's an initiative right now around uh, ageism and how do we add to those discussions all designed to improve, improve uh, health and wellness for older people, especially women with aging. So here we are, uh, Women's Age Lab, we're official. We're so excited to be able to share with you our work and our priority areas uh, as we strive to improve health and well-being for older women through this first and only center of its kind in the world. So we certainly welcome your input and support. I uh, wanna of course thank the Women's Age Lab team that have been working um, so hard to get this launched. They're really quite exceptional. And to thank you, the RTO ERO, for all of your ongoing contributions, your support, as we continue to work together to improve uh, the health and well being of older women. So, thank you. Uh, it's uh, been a wonderful opportunity for us to present about the work uh, that we've been doing and the work that we've been doing uh, with you. And I believe now we'll have a bit of time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Rochelle and Dr. Savage. Uh, my apologies about the sneezing. Uh, I didn't get the opportunity to tell you how honored and thankful we are that you took the time to be with us today. This introduction to the Women's Lab, uh, Age Lab is very illuminating and exciting. 
for us as well as for you. I know that we'll all be interested in knowing what happens as you move forward, because as you pointed out at the very beginning, we are all in this together. Okay, I'm going to go to the Q&A box. Um, we don't have time for all the questions, I'm sorry to say, uh, but um, we'll do some. The idea of shared living situations for elder women helping each other and providing companionship and care to a certain extent. How can we build facilities, homes like this, younger seniors helping older living in same house, not LTC? So maybe I'll start and then I'll hand over um, to Rachel as well. Such an important question that really relates to this idea about um, how do we promote aging in the community? And so how do we support that? And so, um, you know, we've talked about congregate care, but women have taken in, into sort of their own hands the idea of how do they build the kind of care that they want? And there's certainly examples of women coming together with uh, friends, colleagues, and creating communities where they can have shared resources and have um, places designed that they, in the way they want them to be. There's also been examples, you know, because we know that the vast majority of people are living in the community and want to stay there, where uh, there have been some very interesting sharing programs where women actually open up their homes and students, for example, who are in need of housing and ha maybe have trouble affording housing can come and work or live in the homes. And it's a, a very much sort of a, a situation where both people benefit you know, um, the older person can have company and help with some various uh, different kinds of things that they need around the house that may be difficult for them to do. They get to stay in their home, uh, but at the same time, the student gets some amazing accommodation and a chance for new friendship. Uh, Rachel, did you want to add to that? Maybe just to say that that's a formal program now. It's called Home Share, and it's being expanded across uh, the nation. So uh, it started in Toronto, and they're doing a pilot in Barrie, but it's going to be moving across um, Canada. So if you go to Canada Home Share uh, and, and Google that, I think you can find some more information. Thank you. Is it true most drug studies like cholesterol were done on men and not women? I don't know if that's an absolute, um, but I, I think one of the pieces that we've been, we've been talking about is the need in all of the work that we do to include, you know, you need to have women, you need to have men, and you have different age groups. And it's not just including those people in the studies. But one of the pieces we've been talking a lot about is no matter what kind of research you're doing, you need to have age and sex disaggregated data. So you can start to see, for example, patterns. You know, what does it look like for uh, women who are, who are in the younger age groups as opposed to women in the older age group or men in the older age group as opposed to um, women in the older age groups? We need to start looking for these different patterns so that we can understand where differences might exist. And if everyone started doing this and the work that they are um, producing from a research perspective, there'll be a lot of new information coming forward and we'll be able to learn. So we make sure that whatever drug or whatever therapy is being evaluated, we have the kind of information that we need. Thank you. It seems that the onus is largely put in the care of the patient. Great for women that are used to advocate for themselves, but health, prof but health professionals also need to develop skills in dealing with women who for many reasons do little advocating, but trust their doctors to help them manage their care. Does this fall in your approaches to better serving older women in particular? So these are great questions. Um, I think this gets at the idea of some of the sort of the gender differences, you know, the idea perhaps that maybe women may be more, um, less likely to be assertive and less likely to be maybe, for example, risk-taking or ask questions of their physicians or, or things like that. And likewise, the physicians need to think about that. And they need to think about how they may be treating their patients differently, unintentionally, based on, um, on their sex. And so I think you're right that this is clearly something that there is much more attention being given to this issue. 
and something that not only the patients need to think about, but the providers need to be thinking about this as well. Because they need to make sure, for example, that they're engaging women in the conversation and getting the information that they need from the women to make the best decision with them and for them. Thank you. Is there any scientific data that sheds light on why more women than men are susceptible to Alzheimer's? These are all amazing questions and probably not <laughs> quick answers. Uh, uh, so I'll just start with this one. Um, but, you know, I don't know that people necessarily know what those answers are. There's some very interesting work that's being done that talks about what are some of the things that might go into potentially looking at preventing or delaying the development of dementia. But at, at, at a simple level, one of the things to think about is sometimes uh, this can be related to age and women tend to live longer than men. So in part, there's that, but there's it's much more complicated than that. One of the good things about this is there's a huge interest now in women, women's brains, and looking at uh, dementias and how they might differ between women and men, and also what are the pieces that we might be able to put in place to prevent and delay them, uh, but very important uh, issue. Thank you. Addressing ageism for women is a wonderful goal. I wasn't very clear about how you see that being addressed. How and where would that start? How can younger women retired help with this issue? Um, so maybe I'll start and Rachel, you might want to, uh, you might want to think about it too. Um, so in terms of how younger women can help, I think that's really important because it's the younger women today that will be the older women in the future. And so I think they can help in a number of ways. So they can advocate for changes that are gonna be beneficial for women in the years to come. So for example, um, uh, you know, basic things like in the workplace, you know, um, issues around time off for, for childcare and maternity leaves and what can you do to sort of optimize your, your pension as one example is something where you, it's important to take action now for younger women for when they're older. But I think it's also important for younger women to advocate as well for the older women too, uh, recognizing some of the situations that may have been the results of gendered ageism that perhaps could be uh, addressed and looked at differently. So, you know, for example, elevating the issues of some of the disparities that exist and think about uh, what could be some of the strategies that could be done to mitigate. Rachel, did you want to comment on that? Maybe just to add that, you know, there's different ways to kind of tackle these issues. So one is through advocacy and, and Paula had shared that really nice article that uh, got published about, you know, even just letting people know and building awareness of what ageism is and what gendered ageism is. So even uh, we did ask some questions on the survey to RTO members in um, during the pandemic about ageism and a few people well more than a few said I don't know what this is like you should have defined it and and so I think you know there are there is a lot of awareness that needs to be built about um, what that is and that's really the foundation then that we can build upon to start tackling the the issue and in terms of you know how can we tackle it uh, in, intervention research has shown that like actual educational programs can be really helpful. And then intergenerational programs are also so helpful. So exposing uh, younger adults um, and having them work alongside with older adults is one of the best ways, right, to build empathy. And that's so important for um, having an awareness of others and, and being um, empathetic to their needs and experiences. Thank you. We just have time for one more question. Uh, moving forward, how will this information be shared in order to build change in our society and provide alternative living accommodations for senior women? So sharing is a, a major priority for Women's Age Lab. And uh, so therefore we will have a communications individual that will be devoted to finding ways to get this information and to mobilize it, to bring it out 
uh, to the public and to policymakers and people that need uh, to hear about it. So this communication piece is going to be very big. Um, and we'll do it in a variety of different ways. It'll be working with communities directly as we are with uh, our TOERO, um, but it will be using other mechanisms of getting information out that go beyond the traditional science route that we've talked about. So it'll be getting things in the newspapers, in op-eds, you know, having it on our website, using social media, anything we can do to raise awareness and get people uh, familiar uh, with this kind of information. Because as, as you pointed out, uh, you know, communication is going to be really key. Thank you so much, Dr. Brochot and Dr. Savage. And thank you, everyone who took time uh, to take part and pay attention to this very great discussion. If you'd like to support the foundation, you can reach us by phone or mail, which you're seeing on your screen right now, or you can visit, visit us online to get more information about our work or make a donation. Thank you so much in advance for your support. I want to mention to everyone in attendance that a very short survey will pop up on your screen as soon as this webinar ends. Your feedback is very important to us, so please take just one minute to let us know how we did today. Again, from everyone at the Foundation and all those in attendance, a huge thank you to our presenters for taking the time to join us today and deliver such an important presentation. Is there anything that you would like to add, Dr. Rochelle or Dr. Savage, before we finish? I just wanted to say it's, it's such a pleasure to be able to work with the RTO ERO and your work has been so important to help inform our, our thinking. And uh, we just greatly appreciate your support. Thank you. The RTO ERO Foundation has one more webinar, webinar planned this year. So keep an eye out for registration emails for those upcoming events. And that today concludes our webinar from the RTO ERO Foundation and our guests, Dr. Paula Rochon and Dr. Rachel Savage. Please everyone stay safe and healthy. Until I see you again, goodbye. <laughs>